So now we have had a history lesson on how we've developed the periodic table, and today we're going to learn about what all the numbers and symbols mean on the inside of the blocks and have some practice reading the blocks and figuring out what that means for the structure of the atom. So the first point that we need to make about atoms is that they are all electrically neutral, which means that the positive charge of the protons cancels out the negative charge of the electrons. The neutrons don't have any charge, so that doesn't apply. So for our, the atomic number, this is going to be the whole number that you see on the block of the periodic table, and this represents the number of protons or the electrons in an atom of the element. So the protons and electrons normally equal each other. The balance of electrons and protons makes the atom electrically neutral, so it doesn't matter how many neutrons there are because they're already neutral. So atomic mass is the other number represented on the periodic table blocks. And this is the average mass of one atom of an element. And we'll find that there are lots of different types of atoms to represent different elements. And so when we take the average of all those masses, we get this one number that is on the periodic table. So that's why it has a decimal with lots of numbers after it. This is measured in terms of an atomic mass unit, which is abbreviated as an AMU. And when you convert that to something bigger like kilograms, which is what we're used to, it's the same thing as 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms. I'm sorry that's a little sloppy, but I'm trying to write with my finger instead of the squeaky stylus today. So if you want to write that in your notes to give you a reference for how small this mass is, it might be a good idea. So this is a unit for your measuring mass of the particles of an atom, and one proton is about the same as one AMU. So that's how tiny it is. When we talk about any type of length scale when we're dealing with atoms, we use the term nanometer. A nanometer is one billionth of a meter. So it's really, really, really tiny, just again to give you an idea of the scale we're talking about here. So when we're talking about an atom's mass, we're dealing with the protons and the neutrons because they add up to make the, ma the mass of the atom. The electrons are too small to make any difference in the mass. And remember, our comparison is like a proton or a neutron would be similar to a gallon of milk if we could magnify them to the size where we could see them. An electron would be more similar to a dime. So when we read the periodic table, we have several pieces of information in every block. So we have oxygen here as our first example, and the very top number is 8, and it's the whole number, and so that tells us that's the atomic number. The symbol is the one or two letter abbreviation for the element name and then the atomic mass is at the bottom and that's the number that is normally uh, followed by two or three decimal places. So when we want to take the information from the block and list it out we can read it as follows. So atomic number is obviously eight, it's the same thing. The atomic mass when we're trying to figure out how many protons and neutrons it is, it doesn't make much sense to leave it in terms of the decimal. So we're going to round up. Since this is an average, it's okay to go ahead and round to the nearest whole. So in this case, 15.999, we can safely assume that would be estimated to be about 16. So we'll say the mass is close to 16. And again, this is equal to the protons and the neutrons added together. So we just said the protons is the same thing as the atomic number which we just said is 8. So we'll say 8 in this blank. We also said that because protons have a positive charge, we need the same amount of negative charges to cancel that out. So protons and electrons typically equal each other. Finally, the neutrons is when you're going to have to pull in some math because we know the protons, we know the mass, we just need to figure out what the neutrons would be. So if I know my protons is equal to 8 in this case, and I'm trying to figure out neutrons, I know my mass is 16. So you have to ask yourself, what plus 8 is 16? Same math as if I take the mass and subtract protons. Okay, Both times I get 8. So in this case, it's a nice pretty number. Um, I have the same amount of protons, electrons, and neutrons, but it's not always going to be the case. Let's look at this next example for zinc. For this one, we haven't included all the information. First, we need to look at a periodic table and figure out how to fill in the rest of the information here. So for zinc, 
Um, if you look at a periodic table and you just look for atomic number 30 or just the element name zinc, you should find that the symbol is ZN. And again, the first letter is capital. The second one is lowercase. So let's fill in the information on the right. An atomic number is already written here, and that is 30. And we're going to take the atomic mass and round it to the nearest hole so we can figure out how many protons and neutrons there are. So in this case, I've got 65 and 39 hundredths as my mass. Let's round down to 65. Okay, protons equals the atomic number, which is 30. Electrons also equals the atomic number, so we'll write 30 again. And for neutrons, we have to figure out what that number would be. So I have protons, which is equal to 30, looking for how many neutrons there are to equal a mass of 65. So if you can do the math, we should find that 30 plus 35 is equal to 65. Next, let's look at lithium. You should find that the element symbol is Li. And if you look at the block on the periodic table, you can fill in the official atomic mass is 6 and 941 thousandths. So when we interpret this information from the block, you should find the atomic number is 3. The atomic mass will round up to the nearest hole to equal 7. Again, protons and electrons are the same as the atomic number, so we can fill in 3 for both of those. And now we have to do some math to find how many neutrons there are. I know the mass is equal to 3 plus the neutrons, and my mass was 7. So 3 plus blank equals 7. What should that number be? I should have 4. Finally, silicon, when you find it on the periodic table, you should see that the atomic number is 14 and the symbol is capital S, lowercase i. So when we interpret this information, we find the atomic number is 14, and we can round the atomic mass to be a whole number of 28. We need that whole number so we can find how many protons and neutrons there are. So finally, protons and electrons are both equal to the atomic number. And again, we do some math to find how many neutrons there are. We know the protons. We're looking for neutrons, and we know the mass. So 14 plus blank equals 28. You should find that neutrons are equal to 14. Now, um, I'm going to go through one row of this with you, but I would like for you to try to figure out the rest of it on your own and be ready to show me tomorrow um, so I can see that you have tried this a little bit before getting to class. So let's go ahead and fill in this top row for copper. Once you find that on the periodic table, you should see that the symbol is Cu. Now one other piece of information I've given you is how many protons there are, 29. So that matches up to the atomic number. I can go ahead and fill that in, and you can check that against the periodic table. You can also go ahead and fill in the electrons to equal the amount of protons. One thing you do need to look at the periodic table for is the atomic mass, and what we'll do is go ahead and round to the nearest hole. So when you see on the periodic table, um, it should say 63 and 546 thousandths. So that would be rounded up to 64. And now to find how many neutrons there are, we can do some math. Here I'm going to subtract since I have room for that. I'll say 64 minus 29. You can use a calculator for that. I'm just going to do some subtraction here. So 14 minus 9 is 5. 5 minus 2 is 3. So this means I've got 35 neutrons. Now I want you to do the second two rows on your own and be ready to show it to me tomorrow when I come around and check that you did these notes. And if you're completely lost or confused, please come see me during homeroom or just make an educated guess. But I want every single one of these blocks filled in when I come to check these tomorrow. So, when we have these atoms, not every atom is exactly identical because we can manipulate how many protons are in the nucleus or how many neutrons are in the nucleus or how many electrons are spinning around the nucleus. So, if I change how many protons are in the nucleus, that gives me a completely different element because that changes the atomic number. If I have a different atomic number, I'm looking at a different block on the periodic table. If I change how many neutrons are in the atom, 
all that's doing is changing the mass of the atom. It doesn't do anything to the identity. It doesn't do anything to the charge. And so this is something that we call an isotope. So this is just a different type of that same element. If you change the number of electrons in an atom, so say one or two of the electrons jumps out of the circle um, that it's spinning in and goes to a completely different element, or say we get some extra electrons to start spinning around the nucleus, any change is called an ion, and these are used in making bonds with other elements, and this basically is what creates compounds, and we'll talk about that in just a few weeks. So there's some space on your paper where I want you to copy these pictures, and what we're going to do is identify whether we have a whole separate atom between the two pictures, or if we have an isotope or an ion when we compare the second picture to the first in each of these examples. So, in number one, I've got an atom that is drawn that has one proton and no neutrons in the nucleus, and one electron is spinning around the nucleus. The second picture, the only thing I've changed about it is how many neutrons there are. So, this would be considered an isotope because the neutrons have changed. In our second example, I've got one proton, one neutron, and one electron. And in the second part of this example, the second atom that we're comparing here, the only thing that has changed is how many electrons there are. There's nothing in this one. So because the electrons have changed, this is called an ion. Okay, this third one, I have changed how many protons there are, and as a result, that has changed the amount of neutrons and electrons. So because the protons changed, Everything else changed as a result because it changed into a completely new atom. We are going to get tons of practice with this over the next few days, and we're going to start learning how to draw these atoms based on the information we find from the periodic table. So hopefully if you're still a little rusty after these notes, once we spend time on it in class, you'll be much more comfortable with it. So please be sure you're ready to show these to me in class and that you're ready to discuss this with your neighbors and your group. You have a great evening. I'll see you tomorrow.